Superior Court Judge Harold Haley and three others were killed. Investigators for the Marin County Sheriff's Department still are not sure of all the details, but they are piecing together the story from witnesses and participants in the shocking crime that took place here yesterday. Sheriff's inspectors told the press this morning they think the judge was shot at point-blank range with a shotgun inside the getaway van. Uh, at this point, uh, as near as we can determine, um, one of the witnesses in the van said they heard a shot. Uh, immediately, the judge's head was blown off. Uh, the assistant uh, district attorney uh, then grappled uh, with the inmates, uh, procured a gun, and shot three of them. Uh, during this interim, there was other gunfire going on. Um, it has been uh, said by some people that if there hadn't been a large number of deputies out there when the van started to move, there may not have been uh, this exchange of gunfire and the judge might not have been killed. Do you see any truth to that? Uh, there were no deputies out there at the time. There were um, some San Quentin guards and uh, California Highway Patrol. <coughs> uh, there weren't a large amount of them. There probably uh, there were two close by, only two men close by, uh, two San Quentin guards. The others were uh, a considerable distance. Uh, there were some uh, vehicles, uh, San Quentin vehicles, CHP vehicles, parked down uh, where the entrance to the main road is uh, in sort of a tentative roadblock. However, uh, there was an area uh, that was created, that had been created, I'm told, so that the van could have uh, proceeded through. Had the sheriff given orders that the van be let out? Uh, yes, sheriff had given orders uh, to our department that under uh, no conditions was um, uh, any of our deputies uh, to commence firing unless there was no other alternative. One of the amazing things about the escape attempt were the photographs taken of the action by San Rafael Independent Journal Siege with requests for reprint rights from all over the world. Keane was shaken by what he saw and recorded, and so was the rest of the world. Well, I was coming in from an assignment, just a regular normal assignment, and picked up on the police monitor a call from the Civic Center that there was an armed gunman in the corridor. So I rolled to the Civic Center, went up to the court floor, got off the elevator, and I went around a corner and I encountered a man with two guns, and I was part, then part of the action. Well, what happened? Uh, how, how could you get the shots you got without them shooting you? They wanted the publicity. They invited me to take pictures. And I was convinced at that time that this was similar to a Cuban hijack, that there was a purpose behind it. And one of the men, as they left in the elevator, after they told me that they didn't want me as a hostage, did say, we want the Soledad brothers freed by 12.30 today. And I was sure at that point that that's what their intent was. Your pictures were all in focus. How did you maintain your cool and, and do your job under those circumstances? Well, if you could see all the pictures laid out one after another, you could tell that the pictures when they started were pretty much in focus. But as the thing progressed, they got pretty shaky, and in some of them you can really see the camera movement. Were you, were you afraid during all of this? I was more afraid for the people that were held hostage than I was for myself, because I was busy for one thing while it was going on, but after it was over, I was terrified. Could you tell from, from looking at the pictures and from looking at the face while this was happening uh, how the hostages, and especially Judge Haley, were, what was going on in their, their minds? Well, I, uh, when I photographed Judge Haley, uh, I could see the fear in his, in his face and I felt very deeply for it. Nearly a hundred law enforcement officers joined perhaps a thousand Marinites at St. Sylvester Catholic Church for the Mass. There were representatives from as far away as Sacramento who came to pay final respects to the 65... Yes, I am convinced Judge Haley would have been executed, uh, a kind of grudge against the judge. Uh, we also know the nature very uh, uh, inconsiderate of the rights of other people. I have no doubt in my mind that the judge would have ended up dead, regardless of what had happened. In light of what happened to Judge Haley, are you considering changing your policy where no hostages will be allowed out of the prison? Well, this is a firm policy at the prison. We will simply not let dangerous and desperate men escape into the community under threat of 
Aren't you perhaps reconsidering that in the light of what happened? Certainly not. We won't reconsider this. This is a firm policy. It will stay a firm policy. Our job in the prison is to protect the community. We would not be doing our job if we allowed, again, to be unleashed into the community. Uh, and certainly when men take hostages, they are dangerous. And they are the prison. ceremony at the cemetery was brief. Judge Henry Haley will be entombed here later. Nearly a hundred law enforcement officers joined perhaps a thousand Marinites at St. Sylvester Catholic Church for the Mass. There were representatives from as far away as Sacramento who came to pay final respects to the 65-year-old judge. The mayor of San Francisco was one of many city and county officials who came to the San Rafael Church. Judge Haley was a devout Catholic who often attended Mass during the week. He had been one of the pillars of Marin's Catholic community. The pallbearers were longtime friends of the judge. Inside the church, the mourners celebrated the funeral mass of the resurrection for a man who died a violent death intent on escape. Judge Haley's family maintained control through it all his widow and three daughters. Even as the funeral procession arrived at Mount Olivet Cemetery, there was word from San Quentin that 18 convicts in the adjustment center had gone on a hunger strike, protesting the killing of three men, two of them convicts who apparently had killed Judge Haley. Already uh, contacted the Chief Justice and he, in turn, has a court without this kind of violence or whatever is needed for additional protection and security. Now, this medium security prison with 2,700 inmates is on the hot seat of the prison system. Two guards have been murdered here, three black prisoners were gunned down, and in the last week, there have been fights with racial overtones. The latest brickbat for the facility came in the form of a report drawn up by the staff of the state legislature's Black Caucus charging cruel and inhumane treatment of prisoners here. Assemblyman Willie Brown released the report, though prison officials said he hasn't visited the facility. Well, we discovered that uh, not unlike every other prison in the state of California, uh, the amount of time and effort put into rehabilitation was almost negligible as compared to uh, the punitive side. And with that in mind, we thought that the recommendations of at least one physical examination per year for each inmate, at least uh, more than 30 minutes per day uh, exercise for inmates who are cooped up, and that the whole change in the nature of selecting the persons to be in charge of inmates is absolutely necessary as a minimum. And then in addition thereto, what we really discovered was the need for a thorough, ongoing investigation by a body outside of the Department of Corrections uh, to, come to regularly evaluate the prison system and make recommendations for implementation. Judge Haley, for whom mass was said here today, died in one of the most bizarre escape attempts ever staged. The Sheriff's Office now believes from witnesses that there were shots fired from the escape van before the judge was killed. And San Quentin Associate Warden James Park is convinced that the convicts would have shot Judge Haley no matter what happened. Uh, I think that the report, uh, which I have not yet seen, seems to, to from what I read in the papers, uh, make accusations without any supporting evidence. Uh, I don't consider supporting evidence to be some uh, information gathered from some dissatisfied inmates. Uh, when uh, there has not been any cross-section of our inmate body question. Mr. Fitzharris, what do you think has been responsible for the problem institution? The, the unfortunate uh, death of the three intern society. You can't expect these men who come here as re as re As a result of the allegations about this institution, there will probably be investigations and a lot more talk. At the institution itself, the results are being felt now more tenseness in an already tense situation. She's been discussed as a teacher. Uh, she's been talked as a philosophical uh, oriented uh, individual who should be allowed to teach on our university campuses. And we wanted to point out that uh, this woman was more revolutionary by her nature and uh, was involved in the purchase of guns, etc. What was she doing with those guns? I have the foggiest idea what she was doing with the guns at that time. Obviously, since that time, uh, the guns have had rather an interesting 
uh, way throughout the state of California, finally winding up in Marin County, and, and from our information, the guns that were used and the, the killing of the people in Marin County. How did you find out that she had been buying guns? Well, we have, we have quite a few sources uh, in the state of California uh, where we're capable of, of, of getting this kind of information. Uh, we're starting to see the first, well, I think, the advent of, of more and more violence in this country by revolutionaries. And uh, so there's no surprise to me that, that communists will use guns. They've used it in every country they've ever been in. I see no reason why we shouldn't see them using them now. What was she doing with the guns? Do you know that? I, I'm not privy to uh, what the Communist Party does with weapons after they buy them. So I don't know what she was doing with the guns. All I do know that she had association with Jackson. Jackson wound up in the uh, county affair. Do you think it's true communist revolutionary style for her to have bought these guns in her own name? I, I, that'd be difficult. To, that'd be difficult to say. Uh, there's no nothing to be said that, that a communist has to be smart. At least on the surface, the federal courtroom was different. There were no uniformed guards. Ruchel McGee was not chained to his chair as he is in Marin County, and he and Angela Davis were allowed to sit next to each other and even embraced on being brought into the courtroom. But what happened inside was, in effect, about the same as what happens in Marin County. McGee argued with the judge, Judge Samuel Conti, and tried to serve a petition on him. The judge wouldn't let him, and eventually McGee asked to leave the courtroom. He was taken to a holding cell two times, and he called the judge a sick man. Ms. Davis's attorneys argued at length that the judge is prejudiced and the case should be removed to federal court. The state argued the other way. But it appeared that Judge Conti's mind was already made up. He read a prepared order criticizing McGee's and Miss Davis's abuse, as he called it, of the petition process and saying that proceedings in Marin County will go ahead no matter what petitions are filed. And then he sent the case back to the state court in Marin County. Spencer Michaels, KCRA News, San Francisco. Percent of the 10,000 student enrollment of California State at Hayward is black. Many of those blacks, along with about 2,000 white students, heard Angela Davis today claim a victory in her battle with the UC Regents. The 25-year-old philosophy professor, who was fired from her UCLA teaching post by the Regents because she is a communist, said the controversy her case created had its benefits. It exposed the governor and the Regents as unscrupulous demagogues, and she said it focused public attention on the sorry state of education. A court decision last week declared the Regents' action unconstitutional, and so she is now teaching a credit course. She explained today her reasons for belonging to a black adjunct of the Communist Party, the Che Lumumba Club. Angela Davis said the regents want to indoctrinate students. She says education should provide tools with which to evaluate ideas and liberate the mind. And she drew her largest hand when she said, we have to create a revolution in this society. Waking up, they are realizing that while it was necessary in order to ensure their immediate survival to go out and appropriate something, that that kind of individual act is not going to ensure the continued safety of their children. It's not going to ensure a comfortable life free from fear. And they are beginning to say, we have to begin to move on a united, collective level and destroy the root of our oppression. That's what's going on in prison. Brothers and sisters are beginning to see that that thing called crime, while necessary, is not going to solve our problem. So they've been organizing. They're organizing in the prisons all over. And the prison authorities are very, very uptight about that. That's why we are out here today defending the Three Brothers in Soledad prison charged with a trumped up murder charge with the fact that... Expectation. I think everybody anticipated this would happen in the lower courts. The regions, if I read their attentions aright, are determined on a long legal fight. It may take many months, perhaps years, up through the ordinary channels of appeal, clear to the United States Supreme Court. My own hope that by the time the case reaches that latter high tribunal, there will be many new faces on it. Judges appointed by our president who will be willing, after a decade of change, to interpret the Constitution the way it was written not the way they wanted it to be written. 
If that happens, the regents will win their case. Then you're advocating that the regents spend the public's money in taking this case to the Supreme Court to keep communism out of the university. I can't imagine any better way to spend the people's money than by defending the people against communism. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present, you know, things from a Marxist perspective, say that that's what it is. You know, I'm, I'm, there are very many professors who talk from the perspective of the capitalist, capitalist system, but they don't state that this is, you know, from that perspective. They talk about it as if that were objective reality and as if that were the only way of looking at things. At the present time, we have not conferred with the attorneys who are now speaking with Angela and will not be in a position to answer any questions you might have until later in the week. The attempts in the press to link her with a shooting in Marin two months ago is based solely on police informer allegations and has no basis in fact. The pillory of Angela Davis comes at a time when she, with others, was exposing in a mass way the condition of the prison system. Santa Clara County says officially it can and will handle the Angela Davis case. But when it comes to costs, this county is following the pattern set by Marin. It is asking the state for reimbursement. The North County provides uh, suitable facilities for the confinement of Ms. Davis because of its size, ability to control, and to secure with only minor modifications. The presiding judge of the Superior Court of the county uh, has not yet announced uh, where the trial will take place. Ms. Davis will be housed in a six foot by eight foot cell and she will have a, available an adjoining cell of the same size to be used as a workroom. She will be allowed fresh air exercise as provided by the court orders. She will be allowed to associate with other female prisoners in compliance with uh, the penal code regarding certain segregations. So you plan to increase your force? Yes, we have beefed up the security measures at the building and for the court and for the jail. To what extent? I'd prefer not to give the details. In San Jose, the Sheriff's Department has beefed up its press staff as well to handle the expected crush. Sheriff James Geary held a news conference to describe the unusual arrangements in this celebrated case. <laughs> I feel fine. 
on. <laughs> I feel better than I have in 16 months. The real reason why I feel better is because now I'm able to give much more of myself to the struggle to free all of our sisters and brothers. Right on, man. This, of course, has been a true victory for people struggling everywhere. It's a victory in the sense that the abolition of capital punishment is very closely related to all of the struggles that have been conducted around the prisons over the last year. It's related to the murder of George Jackson and to the massacre at Attica. This has been a victory for the people, not only in the sense that I am now out on bail, but it means that the legal apparatus can no longer hold political prisoners in, in prison for long months prior to trial and attempt by isolating them and in many other ways to break their will to fight. Theoretically, can the American system of justice be used by the state for political repression? Well, I don't want to comment on the uh, Davis case because uh, obviously I don't know anything uh, about that. I wasn't in court. But you have to remember one thing uh, uh, about this, that the day of reckoning comes for every prosecutor. He knows that he's going to be in court where he must put up and he must put up to the extent of persuading a jury beyond any reasonable doubt that the charge that he has brought is a true charge. We protect the innocent by requiring the state to prove his guilt beyond any reasonable doubt. A jury may, be, may think a person has done what he's accused of doing. They may believe that but still not be convinced beyond any reasonable doubt. And I'm in favor of retaining this protection of anyone who's accused of crime. But on the other hand, an equally important objective of our system of criminal justice is to protect the community, to protect people from being killed or robbed or mugged or having their houses burglarized. And it is because of these two objectives and the inevitable conflict uh, that arises when one is overweighted beyond the other uh, that we have a serious problem in this country in this area. Well, my own personal opinion, and that's all it can be, I have no evidence otherwise, my own personal op opinion is that this entire incident, starting with the hiring of Miss Davis, was a deliberate provocation. If the black professors at UCLA and others elsewhere in the system won't grade, what action will you recommend to the regents? Well, I think they're guilty of insubordination. I don't think they have any right to refuse to grade students who are taking legitimate catalog courses and leading toward a degree. And I think the students have a right to demand their grades and demand their credits. I intend to make it perfectly clear to the citizens of California that such revolutionary actions as have been occurring at Berkeley and elsewhere are not, and I repeat, not simply the acts of youngsters sowing their wild oats or seriously and legitimately questioning our society and its values. Mob violence erupted and additional police were called to the scene. On that day, police took a tremendous and unprovoked beating from a well-prepared and well-armed mass of people who had stockpiled all kinds of weapons and missiles. They include pieces of steel rods as well as bricks, large rocks, chunks of cement, iron pipes, and so on. Oh, 
American public is now accustomed to chemical agents. The public doesn't even think twice about it. We're being prepared to accept chemical trauma in your race. We saw severe asthmatic patients who are experiencing nitric acid, which are chemically related to the nitrogen mustard gas not is for safety rather than uh, support of the demonstrators. This is really my students, they're, they're uh, good, serious students. They're not involved in this situation uh, in any way, but uh, with this uh, armed force being used around us and tear gas being, uh, dr being dropped just indiscriminately over the whole campus, uh, we, can't, we can't go on, and it's, uh, it's demonstrably not safe. wait for his reaction. His reaction has been given in numerous press conferences and in statements that the governor's office has been making over the past 10 days. We're not interested in what Ronald Reagan thinks individually. We consider him a two-bit Hollywood actor, and that's the way we're going to treat him. And why did you go in and read the demands to him? Because unfortunately, this two-bit Hollywood actor happens to run this state and happens to be responsible for what's happening in Berkeley and elsewhere in this state. We read those demands as basically ultimatums. They are non-negotiable demands. Our struggle around the park continues until those demands are met in full. Well, yes, I think it's a shame. Because it isn't the way to solve anything. Um, just to have a rally and come all the way to Sacramento to stand here and talk to each other, which is what they did. They made it very plain they didn't want any information from us. I was told, uh, I wasn't told personally, my people were told they came in here and made it very clear that they did not want uh, me to come out, so they weren't here to, uh, to hear from uh, apparently anyone in government. So they came a long way to hear the people they could have heard to back home. But over the last few years, there has come into being another kind of political prisoner. And I'm talking about all of the sisters and brothers who are victims of the system, who are easy targets of the police, who get railroaded through the courts into prison, often for no reason at all, uh, who are there only because they're black. And I think uh, a brother during the Attica Rebellion sort of uh, expressed this whole thing when uh, he was asked by a reporter um, what 
he was charged with. And he said he was charged with being black. That's why he was there. And coupled with, coupled with um, the oppression that uh, leads black people and brown people, people of color, into the jails and prisons of this country, has been a new kind of political awareness that has spread all over the jails and prisons throughout the country. Uh, and George Jackson, and Fleeta Drumgo, and John Cluche, and Rochelle McGee, I could go on and on and on to name the uh, sisters and brothers who have achieved a political awareness and a political political commitment behind the walls. But you see, once they do this, then they are subjected to all of the terror that the prison system has to offer. Mm -hmm. And so they end up spending years and years and years in prison under the worst of circumstances. I have said that in the limited opportunities I have, the, or chances uh, to leave or to help the party outside of the state, uh, that I will go uh, wherever the White House and the National Committee uh, feel it is most advantageous to go. And uh, they're handling those now, and it is at their request that I'm going to go and speak uh, to, a, I suppose it'll be the typical fundraiser in both New Hampshire and in Massachusetts. Governor, this week the Vice President said that this country may have come out second best in the ping-pong trip to Red China. Do you share that point of view? All that I heard him express was um, concern about the young people who were rather naive and, and, and who came back uh, extolling. Now, nothing wrong, no complaint about this effort at talking or the idea that young people can, can be great goodwill ambassadors. But they're coming back and extolling uh, so many things of the red Chinese and even suggesting that uh, they would be advantageous for us uh, to adopt. And when you analyze what it was they were extolling, I thought the vice president put it most accurately when he said that um, what they were calling austerity and discipline applied to this country would be called poverty and repression. And, uh, and with this, he just, he just wished that some way they could, they could have a little better balance on, uh, on their analysis. For example, they were, uh, they were enthusing over primary grade children at 6.30 in the morning, marching to class and to school in, in military formation. I doubt that we'd find that very attractive here in this country. The court has before it nearly 10 pretrial motions, and the list is getting longer. They include motions for bail, quashing the indictment, discovering evidence, and releasing grand jury testimony. Yet there has been no action on any substantive motion since these hearings began. And today's hearing was a good example of why. Two hours of argument and suspicion and hostility. The trial has been going on for more than nine weeks in the San Jose courtroom of Contra Costa County Judge Richard Arneson. The prosecution's case, with more than 100 witnesses, moved more quickly than expected. Prosecutor Albert Harris wound up his case by trying to establish Miss Davis's love for Soledad brother George Jackson as the motive for her alleged participation in the escape plot. Just before he rested, he read to the jury edited portions of an 18-page diary or letter written to Jackson 11 months after the shootout. I am totally intoxicated, overflowing with you, the letter said. That so much love could exist anywhere, I never realized. The next day, Harris said, she wrote, I'm crazy with love and desire, and I guess you're already willing to accept all the consequences. Mr. The more that I see of the state of California, the more doubtful I become of whether or not there is any fairness. The more I become impressed by Mr. McGee's position that it's a conspiracy, a statewide conspiracy, perhaps a nationwide conspiracy, to murder him and Miss uh, Davis. Uh, 
We've been dealt with very summarily, very high-handedly by the courts with respect to our honest motions, righteous motions to disqualify the judge. And as long as that we're being treated that way, uh, I would have to feel that there is a conspiracy. I don't know the names of the conspirators. I don't know the particular dates that they met and agreed. I don't know exactly what their ultimate purpose is, except that as it affects my client immediately, I fear that they're trying to take a life. Information Bulletin 72-52. Information regarding last name Blake. 460 PC. Clements. C. Charles L. E. M. E. N. T. S. First name Cecil. Marquez. M. A. R. Q. U. E. Z. Well, I believe that they're putting a policeman on the spot. In essence, they're saying that a policeman is the only one that can legally take another man's life for committing a crime. For the burden itself, I'd say the fact is our professional attitude is going to go towards a criminal now. He's going to have a benefit over us for the fact that he knows he's got an opportunity to take a life. I think just from the, the way the police uh, deaths and things like this are going up, multiplying over the years, this is one of the reasons why it's continuously climbing because uh, you know, the guys can get just about get away with anything. I think it's a deterrent. Now you get life imprisonment, and there's always a possibility of parole. Well, no. I don't think it is a deterrent. People, are, if you're going to kill someone cold-bloodedly, you're going to kill them cold-bloodedly. If you're going to kill someone in the heat of passion, you're going to kill someone in the heat of passion. They say it's not a deterrent to murder because the murder rate keeps going up despite the death penalty, but the murder rate that keeps going up is the type of murder that the death penalty doesn't apply to anyway such as family problems. Uh, today's criminals got little enough respect for law and order as it is without taking away its largest deterrent. It's just making our job that much tougher. I just should have him do it. I mean, the, f the fact that he you know, we're in this silly political situation of recognizing one Chinese government in New York now. Our ambassador to the UN recognizes mainland China. In Washington, the Secretary of State recognizes the government of China as the Taiwan government. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's all right. I'd, I'd much rather have Nixon, you know, taking a trip to China without a policy than people like uh, Rusk and uh, Johnson staying at home and saying things like, by the year 2000, there'll be a billion Chinese, or look out, the Chinese are coming, uh, or McNamara saying, we're going to point the ABM missiles at China. This, this is better than that, but it's, it's still not a, it's not a policy as I see it. We ought to have a policy. Official word came from the Supreme Court clerk's office at noon when the actual decision was passed out to reporters. By a six to one vote, the court ordered life imprisonment for convicted murderer Robert Anderson and made its ruling applicable to all persons now sentenced to die. The court said that capital punishment degrades and dehumanizes all who participate in its processes and is unnecessary to any legitimate goal of the state and incompatible with the dignity of man and the judicial process. The Supreme Court based its decision on the state, not the federal constitution, where cruel or unusual punishment is prohibited. The justices called actual execution cruel, and the lengthy imprisonment prior to execution psychological torture with a dehumanizing effect. Justice McComb, in a four-page dissent, said that he believes the death penalty is constitutional and serves a useful purpose as a deterrent. But the other justices said that execution has become lingering death, and that is cruel in the constitutional sense. Further, they said that now, capital punishment is literally an unusual punishment among civilized nations. Well, I happen to believe that the death penalty is the deterrent. And I think the majority of people believe the same thing. And uh, in those areas in the world where they have outlawed the death penalty, they themselves, in a sense, prove uh, the point that it is a deterrent. Because in almost all of those places, they retain the death penalty uh, for certain crimes under certain conditions. For example, a man sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, they reserve the death penalty for him if he then, serving a life sentence, commits another murder, such as a guard in prison or another inmate. 
because they recognize that once serving a life sentence, if there is no further punishment you can give him, then he has a free ticket to kill anyone that gets in his way. So they recognize it. Now, I don't quite understand how these people can say the death penalty is not a deterrent, we therefore will eliminate it, except we will keep it as a deterrent under these other circumstances. They can't have it both ways. Davis and her attorneys had fought hard to keep the diary from being entered as evidence. The jury seemed especially interested in the four guns entered as evidence, weapons the prosecution alleges were purchased by Ms. Davis for use in the violent escape attempt. Harris's case is admittedly circumstantial. The purchase of those guns, the fact that Miss Davis was allegedly seen near the courthouse and at San Quentin in the week preceding the shootout, and her flight from San Francisco. The evidence presented in court contained few surprises and followed pretty closely allegations and evidence made to the Marin County Grand Jury when it indicted Miss Davis. The defense will attack that series of events as coincidental and not proving anything other than Miss Davis's concern for her own safety and her involvement in militant leftist political causes. The jury in the Angela Davis case has been told to report back to the courtroom at 9 o'clock on Thursday morning. At that time, the defense will begin its attempt to raise a reasonable doubt in the minds of the 12 jurors and three alternates about the involvement of Miss Davis in the Marin County shootout of August 1970 in which four persons, including a judge, died. In the recent Barrigan conspiracy trial in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the defense failed to put on any case at all. That will not happen in San Jose at the Angela Davis trial, according to a spokesman for the Davis Defense Committee. There will be defense witnesses, and one unanswered question now is whether Miss Davis herself will be among them. Could change the state decision now. Well, you could do it two ways. The state Supreme Court could change their mind, which is not likely. The second way is for the initiative presently being circulated to pass. The real issue is whether he should be sentenced to life in prison, where he'd be eligible for parole in seven years. That doesn't mean he'll get out in seven years necessarily, but he'll be eligible for parole in seven years, or whether he should be sentenced to life without possibility of parole. And we're arguing the latter. We're arguing that uh, a death penalty necessarily includes him never coming back. And we're saying that this is a certain uh, remainder interest which the people have uh, in never seeing Willie Curtis Miller again in society. Is there a precedent for this? There's very little precedent. There's none that I know of at the moment. With no precedent, are you really working on a change in the law or a new law completely? Well, we're, what we're trying to do is uh, articulate the position that the people have in this matter. Uh, there is legislation now pending uh, to, to uh, provide an alternative of life without possibility of parole for first-degree murderers. Um, the legislature really hasn't had a chance to act on this, and w whether they will eventually is a matter of speculation. But w I feel very comfortable in asserting that the people's interest uh, is not being accounted for under uh, this present gap in the law. And is. Uh not particularly disturbing, certainly not surprising. Normally when a state Supreme Court hands down a decision which they say is based upon state law, the uh, United States Supreme Court won't uh, hear it. We were aware of that. The odds were uh, not very good in our favor. The main question, of course, as to whether the death penalty is constitutional is presently before the Supreme Court. We expect that they will hand down a decision on that within a matter of uh, weeks. It could have come today. Uh, if they decide, as we think they will, that the Supreme, that the death penalty is constitutional, that a state can impose it in an appropriate case, then we'll be in the situation where it's constitutional in 49 states and unconstitutional in California because of the state decision.
I heard one of the stewardesses come running up to the other stewardess and she said, this is it, it's happening to us. And I asked her what was happening to us and then I saw a man in an army uniform come up the aisle and go into the cockpit and I knew we were being hijacked I started crying. I told my husband. And through all of this, he never displayed a weapon. He just did it by voice. He never displayed a weapon to me. He might very well have had a gun in the back of the pilots. I don't know. There's nothing we can do. We were sitting there at the mercy of whatever he decided or his people in the back decided they wanted to do to us. It was scary, to be sure. Was it, everybody was fairly calm, you say? There were a few people who were upset. I was upset. Were the passengers aware that there was a half a million oh, yes. dollars? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They didn't know the amount. They knew that the... Uh, there was a lot of money involved. How did he decide who to take with him and who to leave here? Evidently, he decided, he said, the whole right-hand side of the airplane. That's, what, were there some children there? Yes, and he let the, um, he let the uh, I think a mother and four or five kids stay behind, and a uh, diabetic stay behind. The whole left-hand side stayed on the airplane. This sounds like a terrifying experience, was it? Well, it was a little harrowing, yes. <laughs> The hijacker had announced over the intercom earlier, SDS men relax, our demands are being met. And another message had included the word weathermen, which is a radical offshoot of Students for a Democratic Society. After a refueling stop in New York, where the passengers were let off, the Western 720H took off again for Algeria with a half a million dollars at the San Francisco International Airport. The five men and seven women on the Angela Davis trial jury have been dividing their time between the jury room, a Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department bus, and a hotel near the courthouse. Judge Richard Arneson has sequestered them during their deliberations, although during the trial itself they could go home every night and on weekends. When the jury went out at 11 Friday morning, Ms. Davis's supporters began a vigil in front of the courthouse. Demonstrations had been forbidden during the trial, but sheriff's deputies didn't interfere with the 50 or so persons who decided to wait out the verdict on the lawn. Among them, communist Bettina Abtecker, who played ball, and women's liver Kate Millett, who played frisbee. During yesterday's hijacking, in which it was thought Miss Davis had been demanded by the hijacker, the defendant was brought to the courtroom. She looked distraught and tired. 
Defense Committee spokeswoman Stephanie Allen issued a statement concerning the hijacking. We don't know anything about this hijacking. We don't agree with this as a method to obtain Angela Davis's freedom. We have built a strong mass movement, and because of that, we are sure that Angela will be acquitted. If by some far stretch of the imagination she is not acquitted, we will continue to build that movement until her eventual freedom. Were you with Angela when she heard about this skyjacking? Yes, I What was. was her reaction? Surprised. We were both surprised. It didn't, uh... I don't believe it. <laughs> it Yesterday, before the hijacking incident, Miss Davis was asked what she thought the jury might do. And her answer was, I'm not making any predictions. I'm just waiting like everybody else. From this rented flat in San Francisco's declining Petrero District, $16,000 has been raised to defend the Soledad brothers. The case has become a radical cause celebre and has attracted attention nationwide. Dr. Benjamin Spock, Senator Joseph Clark of Pennsylvania, and Communist Angela Davis are among the members of the Soledad Brothers Defense Committee. The brothers are three inmates from Soledad State Prison, George Jackson, Fleeta Drumgo, and John Clichet. They are charged with murdering a guard. The incident took place at the Monterey County Prison in January, three days after another guard had shot to death three black prisoners he claimed were involved in fights. That shooting has been ruled justifiable. The murder of guard John Mills seemed to be in retaliation, and after an investigation, Jackson, Drumgo, and Clichet were arrested for the murder. They say they were nowhere near the murder scene. Last Friday's escape attempt and deadly shootout at the Marin County Civic Center pushed the Soledad case back into the limelight. The youth who brought guns into Judge Haley's courtroom was Jonathan Jackson, brother of one of the Soledad three. Jonathan had yelled in the courtroom corridor to free the Soledad brothers before he made his escape and was killed. The Jackson boy's mother, George Jackson, told the press she no longer believes that blacks can get justice in the courts. In Berkeley, the attorney for defendant George Jackson, Faye Stender, says black prisoners are brutalized at Soledad and that the Soledad brothers are innocent. The law thinks that when O.G. Miller murdered three black inmates on January 13th, that the state of California started something that's going to be very hard to finish. I think that all inmates in the state of California are determined that they're not going to be murdered and brutalized any longer. And the three Soledad brothers have been chosen as scapegoats for, for that. And um, I think that's pretty important because I think the inmates um, have joined the revolution. There seems to be concern that during the trial of the Soledad brothers, there may be some sort of an incident, perhaps a repetition of what happened in Marin County. Are you concerned about that? Um, I'm concerned that there will be a repetition of um, the guard that killed three inmates on January 13th without any uh, serious investigation, and that a district attorney whose job is to present evidence in court is boasting that he killed three people and that a guard from San Quentin opened fire on people who had not fired one shot at all and was willing to risk the lives of the judge and cost the life of the judge and those three jurors. I don't think it's we that have to be talking about security. I think the state of California has to, ought to ask itself who it's murdering. The Soledad case was moved to San Francisco, although presiding judge Carl Allen had thought it might be safer in San Quentin. Allen is disturbed by an atmosphere today in which he says defendants and their attorneys become public heroes. 
this disturbs me more than anything else to think that the public would take and and and, and hero worship with some of these lawyers who try to say uh, to uh, that conduct themselves in this bizarre manner in a courtroom. You think it's just for the lawyers, or do you think it's for the defendants too? Well, they also worship the defendants, of course. An example of that is that, according to the news media, it was five thousand people out to uh, welcome Huey Newton when he's released from the jail. I don't know what entitles him to have. What did he do to entitle him to have five thousand people out to welcome him? Your Honor, you at first suggested that the Soledad brothers' trial be moved to San Quentin prison, and then you changed your mind or you rescinded that suggestion. What was your thought behind that? Well, I thought that uh, for security reason, to be absolutely s secure, perhaps that should be the place to try it. Then you have the question whether that's a proper atmosphere for the, uh, to, ins to ensure a, a fair and impartial trial by bringing the jurors and everybody in the, into that setting. Is that why you decided not to pursue it? No, that isn't why we decided not to. I don't know of any law that permits us to assign it to send it over there. The trial of the Soledad brothers is scheduled to start here in the security of San Francisco's Hall of Justice in late September. And no matter which side one is on, that trial promises to be a test of the judicial system under extreme pressure. Spencer Michaels, KCRA News, San Francisco. The sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun that killed Judge Haley during the shootout was traced to this pawn shop. Here, Angela Davis showed her driver's license for identification and signed the firearms transaction record as required by law. The single-barrel weapon cost $34.50. It, along with three other guns used in the fatal escape attempt, have now been linked to the 26-year-old former UCLA assistant professor. Marin County authorities have asked the FBI to join in the search for her. She's charged with one count of murder and five counts of kidnapping under a California law which holds anyone who aids a major crime as guilty as the participants. The search for Angela Davis has spread from Los Angeles, through the Bay Area, through Canada, to a series of raids in her hometown of Birmingham after a U.S. District Court judge issued the fugitive warrants and set bail at $100,000. Vern Hawkins, KCRA News at the Marin Civic Center. Well, first of all, you'll have to understand that her conduct is not so much black as it is red. The fact is that Angela, by her own statements, is a part of the revolutionary worldwide communist movement, and her, ex her, her conduct has to be looked upon in that light. I don't know any other way to explain the recent conduct or the allegations of conduct. But let me just tell you that I suppose you ask me about Angela because she's black and so am I. If I must take responsibility for her and Mr. Jackson, let me give you Charles Manson because he's white like you are. At the present time, we have not conferred with the attorneys who are now speaking with Angela and will not be in a position to answer any questions you might have until later in the week. The attempts in the press to link her with a shooting in Marin two months ago is based solely on police informer allegations and has no basis in fact. The pillory of Angela Davis comes at a time when she, with others, was exposing in a mass way the condition of the prison system. For the moment, and perhaps until the end, the proceedings in the case of the People versus Angela Davis and Ruchel McGee are taking place here, the Marin County Civic Center. This is where Judge Harold Haley and three others were killed in the August shootout, and this is where Judge Joseph Wilson has decided preliminary procedural matters will take place. Miss Davis's defense wanted the matter to be heard in a larger hall, accommodating more spectators but the judge said he preferred a real courtroom atmosphere. The trial, he said, will of course be public. Security continues to be extremely tight for the spectators and especially for Ruchel McGee. He was bound around the neck, wrists, and body with chains for his court appearance and objected. Miss Davis, who was participating in her own defense thus far, cried out during the hearing, free Ruchel McGee. In court and out, references are constantly made to how much worldwide interest there is in this case. 
Franklin Alexander heads a national united committee to free Angela Davis. The illegal character of the whole campaign against Angela, and especially her brutal treatment at the Women's House of Detention in New York City, and her total isolation at the Marin County Jail, have brought the court and penal systems into further serious question in the minds of thousands of people in this country and in the world. Ms. Davis's attorney, Alan Brodsky, talked about some as yet unsettled aspects of the case. You keep mentioning a trial, and yet the judge said that this is only for one hearing. Do you not intend to seek a change of venue? We, we've made our position clear on that. That issue is going to be uh, resolved after the pending motions, some of which, if granted, will make the whole proceeding moot. We'll dismiss the whole proceeding, so that's not, a, that's not an issue at the moment. Ms. Davis is taking an active part in, uh, in her defense. Could you give us some idea of, of what she does during the day? I mean, is it a 20-hour a day uh, poring over law books? She is working hard, and she is working uh, vigorously in her own defense. I think that just about sums it up. On Tuesday, Brodsky will argue for bail, that the indictment against Ms. Davis be quashed, and that she be allowed to serve as her own attorney at the trial. to costs, this county is following the pattern set by Marin, Palo Alto. Since October 1970, first in New York, later in Marin County, in jail in the Santa Clara County Courthouse in Palo Alto. When word the house, mainly made up of newsmen, some of her supporters were there too. Broke of seven, three hours after Judge Arneson signed the order, she walked out of the to a waiting car. While she is awake, and her movements will be restricted to the Bay Area. A bail bond of $100,000, that in addition to $12,500. Uh, she, she just made a public appearance tonight by leaving the jail. Uh, in terms of appearing at rallies and meetings, no, she cannot and, uh, at the present time. I'm going to get out of here. A lot of entertainers said they'd be glad to put up the money for it. Did you hear from any of them today? Yes, they did. We did have contact with the entertainer who would have gone all the bail and double over, except for the fact that she was out of the country at this time and it wasn't possible to uh, complete the transaction this afternoon. Uh, every entertainer that has publicly indicated that he or she would support Ms. Davis and go bail did uh, evidence uh, their willingness to keep that commitment today. However, circumstances were was, was such that they couldn't... Uh, could you say a few words about what Ms. Davis said in the last couple of hours? Well, the last thing I heard her said was goodbye. <laughs> it's not fixed by law? No, but it was usually 10 percent. Regardless of the size. In this case, what is it, sir? Pardon? In this case, what is it? 
In this case, uh -huh. 10 pounds. 10 percent, so. Yeah, it'd be 10 pounds. Now she'll also have to pay that 2,500, won't she? That, that's it. That was. The, so it'll be 12.5. Uh, that would be uh, Mr. Moore's. By Mr. Moore. One more. Are you concerned about this bond at all that you'll get the money back? Oh, I think so. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think I'd drive it. It's pretty hard to lose $100,000. Angela Davis and her supporters were, of course, ecstatic at her release from jail. Her attorney, Howard Moore, said that the man who put up the $100,000 for the surety bond was Roger McPhee of Fresno County, a cooperative farmer. Angela Davis goes from in Santa Clara County, where she will stay during the... The real reason why I feel better is because now I'm able to give much more of myself to the struggle to free all of our sisters and brothers. Right on, Angela. This, of course, has been a true victory for people struggling everywhere. It's a victory in the sense that the abolition of capital punishment it's very closely related to all of the struggles that have been conducted around the prisons over the last year. It's related to the murder of George Jackson and to the massacre at Attica. This has been a victory for the people, not only in the sense that I am now out on bail, but it means that the legal apparatus can no longer hold political prisoners in, in prison for long months prior to trial and attempt by isolating them and in many other ways to break their will to fight. The only thing I would say is that many of those who have been demonstrating and protesting and who have incidentally found the United States and our system of justice guilty without a trial, I would think might have some second thoughts now and be willing to accept that our system does work. No, uh, this was the same cry that was raised at Attica in New York. I think we have a great many felons in prison, uh, guilty of crimes ranging all the way from crimes of violence and murder and rape to robbery and so forth, who would be delighted and in the present spirit of the times uh, are trying to um, transfer their image, transform their image to one of being uh, oppressed politically. And it must be much nicer for them to think of themselves as uh, the unjust victim of political harassment than really uh, serving time for the crimes they committed. Well, my own personal opinion, and that's all it can be, I have no evidence otherwise, my own personal op opinion is that this entire incident, starting with the hiring of Miss Davis, was a deliberate provocation. If the black professors at UCLA and others elsewhere in the system won't grade, what action will you recommend to the regents? Well, I think they're guilty of insubordination. I don't think they have any right to refuse to grade students who are taking legitimate catalog courses and leading toward a degree. And I think the students have a right to demand their grades and demand their credits. I intend to make it perfectly clear to the citizens of California that such revolutionary actions as have been occurring at Berkeley and elsewhere are not, and I repeat, not, simply the acts of youngsters sowing their wild oats or seriously and legitimately questioning our society and its values. Mob violence erupted and additional police were called to the scene. On that day, 
Police took a tremendous and unprovoked beating from a well-prepared and well-armed mass of people who had stockpiled all kinds of weapons and missiles. They include pieces of steel rods as well as bricks, large rocks, chunks of cement, iron pipes, and so on. Not is for safety rather than uh, support of the demonstrators. This is really my students. They're they're uh, good, serious students. They're not involved in this situation uh, in any way. But uh, with this uh, armed force being used around us and tear gas being uh, being dropped just indiscriminately over the whole campus, uh, we can't we can't go on. And it's uh, it's demonstrably not safe. wait for his reaction. His reaction has been given in numerous press conferences and in statements that the governor's office has been making over the past 10 days. We're not interested in what Ronald Reagan thinks individually. We consider him a two-bit Hollywood actor, and that's the way we're going to treat him. And why did you go in and read the demands to him? Because unfortunately, this two-bit Hollywood actor happens to run this state and happens to be responsible for what's happening in Berkeley and elsewhere in this state. We read those demands as basically ultimatums. They are non-negotiable demands. Our struggle around the park continues until those demands are met. Well, yes, I think it's a shame because it isn't the way to solve anything. Um, just to have a rally and come all the way to Sacramento to stand here and talk to each other, which is what they did. They made it very plain. They didn't want any information from us. I was told, uh, I wasn't told personally, my people were told they came in here and made it very clear that they did not want uh, me to come out, so they weren't here to, uh, to hear from uh, apparently anyone in government. So they came a long way to hear the people they could have heard to back home. I think it's quite exciting that it's a term that has uh, acquired a kind of currency. Uh, uh, at the very beginning, when uh, it was introduced, it was always necessary to uh, engage in uh, a rather long conversation explaining the meaning of the prison industrial complex. Of course, uh, 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 the resonances with the military industrial complex are, are what uh, uh, most people immediately think about. Uh, um, but as I think back, I, I, I remember that we were attempting to capture the, um, the globality of uh, the organization of punishment, even as we were very specifically attempting to uh, create a way to understand why it was that uh, such huge numbers of people were in prison in the U.S., uh, the, the racial disparities of the prison population, um, and at the same time the decline of education, of health care, and, and, and so forth. I think what uh, was so important about that term was that it moved us away from simply thinking about uh, punishment or jails and prisons in isolation uh, from everything else. Uh, uh, and 
even though uh, uh, many of us in that movement had been doing work around prisons for decades, uh, and uh, initially very specifically around political prisoners. Uh, and I always like to point out that, uh, that without the, the aid of people in prison, we would not have been able to uh, uh, begin to craft uh, a, a, a larger analysis of the role of the prison. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking about George Jackson, uh, who argued uh, you know, back in uh, the late 60s and the early 70s that uh, uh, we, we needed to uh, think not only about uh, the prison as the site of political repression of people who were engaging in social justice activism in the so-called free world, but we had to try to begin to understand how that apparatus was key to uh, the 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 um, way racism functioned in our society. Uh, so there were a lot of questions that were questions, uh, and many of them are still questions. Uh, but I think what was most important was that was precisely that it allowed us to ask questions, uh, and it um, it uh, uh, made people recognize that what they thought they knew they really didn't know. Uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, as we uh, try to move the conversation more toward abolition today, uh, that, um, that posture of raising questions uh, is what uh, is most important about uh, the, the way the, um, the prison industrial complex as a concept has functioned. Mm -hmm.